Um, okay, ladies and gents. Um, we're not going to play an intro today. I nearly played the Black Bear but since uh, my guest Colin Liddell is a Scotsman, but uh, perhaps I'll do that on another stream. Um, I'm very happy to have Colin Liddell this evening. He's the chief editor of the Affirmative Right website and uh, a chap whose um, insights on the uh, right of politics, shall we say, um, I have uh, admired for quite a long time. Um, so uh, I'm quite happy to have him here today. I've got some questions of my own and also a couple of questions from some friends of mine. Um, perhaps um, for anyone who doesn't know, Colin, you could uh, maybe just give a brief sort of uh, rundown of who you are. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm. Um, well, I'm, I'm one of the founders of uh, the alt right, a uh, much uh, abused and maligned uh, term now, of course. But uh, going back to uh, 2010, uh, I got in at the ground floor with the start of the alt right uh, with uh, Richard Spencer's site, alternativeright.com, and uh, me and my uh, close uh, ally and uh, compatriot. Well, not he's not really a compatriot because he's American, but my my ally, at least, uh, Andy Nowicki, we did most of the writing in, in the early years. And then that continued. Our association with Mr. Spencer continued until December 2013, uh, when due to, um, I guess, all sorts of uh, factors like being overworked or overcoaxed or just uh, a lazy, privileged brat, he decided to... Uh, uh, close the site down. And so then we uh, decided to keep the site going, has alternative rights. And uh, we sort of fought the tendency in the wider alt-right towards um, the kind of stormatard direction that it was taken in by uh, groups like uh, The Right Stuff and The Daily Show podcast and uh, Andrew Anglin's site. And so we strongly resisted that tendency uh, which led to a lot of infighting and punching right, uh, which you, you weren't supposed to do apparently, but we did it anyway. And uh, we kept uh, the site going, has alter has uh, alternative right blog spot until uh, 2018, when uh, I decided that the term alternative right had become so um, kind of toxified that uh, it was no longer a useful term, and I uh, rebranded the site as uh, Affirmative Right. Uh, the site is essentially the, um, the founding site of the uh, alt-right in its uh, glorious earlier phase. Yeah, was, there, was, there, there was a little bit more sort of wider free expression from what I could see back in those days than, than it became later. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Later, this, this, the site... Uh, well, the movement, the so-called alt-right, uh, it kind of split off. You had a kind of alt-light element which kind of split off. And uh, the, the alt-light is, um, you know, always has been a bit of a joke, you know. Uh, it's sort of typified by people like uh, Milo Yiannopoulos and, um, you know, Paul Joseph Watson. And, you know, some of the content they do is quite good. I mean, it's sort of, it's good entry-level normie stuff. Uh, you know, they, they pick a lot of low-hanging fruit and they kind of highlight the um, kind of um, absurdities of the modern multicultural, uh, you know, post-feminist, post, -feminist, post uh, you know, gay liberation state. And, you know, they're, they're, they're fine for that. But uh, essentially they are, you know, I guess you'd call them cocks. They, they avoid some of the more uh, hard-edged, serious issues. Uh, their analysis is never particularly deep, um, and so that's that. That's one side of uh, what was the alt right, uh, the alt light, and then the other side of the of the old alt right kind of veered towards uh, this kind of neo Nazi message. You know, Hitler did nothing wrong. Blah blah blah. The Jews are um, these uh, incredible supermen who control the universe and who are responsible for all the evil. Blah blah blah. And so those are the two um, branches, and and this this the, the sort of space in the middle, which used to be where the old the old alt right was, which was kind of like much more um, nuanced, much more um, um, kind of uh, analytical in a much deeper and more profound way. That has uh, been sort of largely neglected now, and uh, you know um, it's sort of lost its cohesion. So there are still a lot of people doing good work and good analysis. 
but as a movement it's sort of splintered off into um two very unsightly um twins yeah yeah i've got a question from uh, a friend of mine um about precisely that and i'm gonna just refresh what he wanted me to ask you um he, he was asking what do you think about the current state of the alternative right and where do you think it's going now and also what do you think about um the current uh dissident right and in inverted commas as it now tends to refer to itself um, do you think um explicit ethno-nationalism uh is a dead end or do you think it's still got somewhere to go um and as it uh, as uh people increasingly get kicked off sites like youtube um where is it going to go in terms of actually talking to people what, what what's your opinion on that stuff uh yeah well is it, is it a dead end uh, i mean i think um <clears throat> obviously um the mainstream is extremely um flawed and dysfunctional and if we follow the, uh, the ideology of the mainstream it doesn't really go anywhere you know basically the the ideology of the mainstream is racial replacement and uh, feminist um inspired birth rates of under 1.5 fertility rate uh, you know which is basically a um i think that's a 25 percent drop in population each generation and um, so the the mainstream narrative, uh, the, ideolo the mainstream ideological narrative is, you know, just uh, you know, do your job and spend your money and uh, indulge in consumerism. If you have any religious um, inclinations, you know, just uh, do what you want on on the uh, quiet in private, not as part of a kind of society. And uh, you know, don't worry about the fact that uh, the population is dropping every uh, by twenty five percent every generation. Because guess what? The third world's full of uh, wonderful people who want to uh, kind of stock up our uh, demographic deficiency. You know, what I mean, so that's, that's, that's basically what they're selling us, uh, the mainstream. And you know, if you look at that, you, you think they must be stark staring mad. You know, that's that's a uh, the most extreme thing possible. That's, that's that's on a level of extremism that is higher and more extreme than what happened in the Soviet Union, uh, which used to kill millions of its people quite freely, and Nazi Germany, which killed a lot of fair uh, people in uh, all over Europe. So, you know, this is this is the level of extremism we're on. I mean, even 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 the, um, those totalitarian regimes did not destroy their core population at uh, with such efficiency yeah yeah no I, I don't disagree with you at all I, I one of the things that uh, my friends and I have been talking about both on streams and also in private is um, how do we combat this because I, I see uh, I, I see the kind of natsoc um, thing as a cul-de-sac I don't think it's going to go anywhere um, I don't think it has an appeal to most average people. Um, it's certainly not in countries like the UK, which has no history of kind of fascism or national socialism, socialism really. Um, so I see that as a bit of a dead end. Um, and certainly from my own point of view, but also quite a lot of the people I know, uh, we're trying to find some sort of middle way to um, combat this uh, uh, globo homo nonsense that we're in at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, there's there's a number of uh, ways to look at this. I, I think uh, there's there's sort of negative measures, and there's positive measures. And so, like on the negative side, we we have to recognise that there is a there is a system of oppression, and uh, you know we've become increasingly aware of that, especially in the last few years. You know, because I think uh, if you go back about five or six years, most people were still. Yeah, still had the naive belief that you know there was democracy and there was free expression and that you know you could have your say yeah. and that you could vote your way out of this. And you know what we've um, what we've seen increasingly is that uh, actually you know democracy is a bit of a sham, especially the two party system, uh, the first past the post two party system, which is what uh, we have in the uh, the kind of Anglo world. Uh, you know, if you're in America, you, you've got a great choice. You know, you're going to vote for these. Uh, uh, the Democrats or the or the Republicans who are practically aligned on most issues, mm -hmm. um, the the Republicans believe in mass immigration, 
And the Democrats believe in mass immigration. They just have uh, different reasons, maybe, for believing in it, you know. Um, in Britain, it's the same with the Labour and the Tory party. I mean, they're, they're part of the mainstream. So they're part of this mainstream ideology of racial replacement. So, um, and that's your choices. If you want to vote outside that, you, you, you know, you, you slip, in, slip into the category called uh, wasted voter or wasted mm -hmm. vote. And you, you know, you, maybe you um, you vote for the Lib Dems. They're just um, exactly the same as the other two parties. Uh, or you vote for UKIP. UKIP is okay. They uh, signal pretty hard on immigration and so on. But uh, you know, they they also take basically subscribe to the ruling ideology. They're not really challenging it. Uh, they are all about the. They're they're basically a bit uh, alt light in some respects. They're all about the based black man or the the based Asian or whatever the based gay person you know so and um, maybe they have to do that because of the um you know the political ecosystem it's very difficult for a, a, a immigration restrictionist party to come out with a you know kind of um hard-edged ethno-nationalist message that's not really gonna mm. fly for all sorts of reasons so i mean there is a certain kind of uh, tactical element to what they're doing, the kind of moral shield and so on. And even people like Tommy Robinson use the moral shield. I mean, they're so pro-Jewish, it's unbelievable, you know. And yep. we know what's really going on there, you know, because if you're if you're opposing Muslims, you're going to be accused of being racist. But if you say, I'm opposing Muslims because they're anti-gay and they're anti-women and feminism and they're anti-Jewish, then you're in a slightly better position with the uh, sort of mainstream British uh, voter, you know. Um, yeah, I, I wonder though. Do do you think that the mainstream British voter is really um, as uh, left wing liberal as it sometimes appears, or do do you think? And this brings me on to a question another one of my friends asked: that there's so much social conditioning these days, like at school, university, obviously from the mainstream media. Um, that does it. Um, this social conditioning, I think tends to stop people actually openly expressing what they really think. Um, do, do you think that's the case? Because I, I certainly do, but I'd, I would be interested to hear what you think about that. Well, yeah, I mean, I completely agree. The, the ordinary British people, they don't want any of this. But um, the culture, everything around them is pushing them in directions they don't want to go. It's like, uh, it's like herding sheep, you know, using certain kind of uh, fences and railings and so on. And they, they're not allowed to um, scatter in the directions they want to scatter. They're, they're sort of pushed along certain channels. And uh, they're not, they're, they're, they know there's something wrong with it, but they don't have the, um, the equipment, the ideological equipment and the cultural equipment to really fight back against it and this is this is something that um you know the the dissident right or the old, the old alt right was was trying to create and trying to uh, you know give them the means by which to overthrow this uh, system of control and of course uh, that's why that system of control uh, the, the means of overthrowing that system of control then had to be subverted and sabotaged you know so this is a, the kind of um the sort of meta-political equation we're living in, you know. So uh, even if you fashion tools that, that can be used by uh, the ordinary normie voters to, to overthrow their oppression, then that uh, system itself is then attacked and undermined, you see. And we, so there's, there's, there's different things that the dissident right has to be aware of. It has to be aware of the fact that it's not going to be left alone. It's going to be attacked and it's also got to be aware of the, 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 the way in which the ordinary people who actually would be sympathetic with its message are being pushed away and controlled. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I, I do. Um, do. Do you see, I mean, other than obviously what you were saying about the old or right before it got pushed into this kind of um, natsop cul-de-sac, um, the old alt right, as you said, was like giving people intellectual arguments, etc., against some of this globo homo social liberalism stuff. Um, do, do you see other ways that today that, that that we on the right can fight back against this kind of stuff? Well, um, yeah, I was mentioning this. There's like negative measures, which uh, is recognizing this, the system of oppression. I mean, for example, in the case of um, uh, Britain, you know, if we if we just had like real democracy, uh, you know, that would that would solve a, a great deal of the problems by itself, you know, because you would have a competitive political system 
in which different parties could offer different messages and uh, these messages would resonate with uh, you know to a different degree with the voters and that would uh, the voters would select the messages that uh, were in their best interests which would obviously be towards a more kind of sane form of nationalism so would um, you support um uh, proportional representation that kind of stuff actually i would yeah i mean um, as, as a kind of like a negative means of um you know if, uh, dealing with this problem uh, overthrowing the system of repression uh, you first of all you, you, you destroy the present uh, you know two-party first past the post system which is clearly there to stifle uh, people's democratic urges. If you gave people, if you if you gave into the uh, democratic urges of the mass of the British people, most of them would choose relatively sensible things compared with uh, to what they're getting now. Mm. And we saw that perfectly with Brexit. I mean, this is like this was one rare instance where they uh, you know made this uh, horrendous error on their part of uh, you know giving democracy. To the British public, they, 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 for all sorts of reasons, they assumed that they could control this, and uh, the British people basically stood up and slapped them right in the face, and uh, we're still, you know, dealing with that. And of course, it, uh, I mean, you know, uh, it looks like uh, Britain is heading for a, a no deal, and uh, you know, we're getting a real nice hard Brexit. And God, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, and it's just, it just, it's just one of those beautiful moments in political history. So I think if you had a, uh, you know, like a multi-party proportional representation, if you got one percent of the vote, you got one percent of the representation. Like one percent of the vote in Britain would probably give you about six MPs, wouldn't it? Something like that. Mm. And if you had something like that, small parties, uh, you'd have some extreme left-wing parties. They'd get represented. That's fine. You get some uh, nationalist parties that get represented. You get some sort of soft national nationalist parties, they get represented. And then you'd have a free market of fair uh, political ideas. And of course, you wouldn't have a majority, you probably have all sorts of um, coalitions. Aw awkward coalitions, but that's all part of the process. You know, what I mean, so you'd, uh, it, uh, certain ideas and coalitions would be tested and found wanting and so on. But uh, the main thing is, um, most people would, um, would be very, very resistant to a lot of these ideas that are, that are kind of forced down their throat by the two party system. Now, on the, the positive measures, I mean, I think nas the nationalist me message um, has to be, um, you know, evolved and refined in certain ways. And you have to realize, uh, like, why the nationalist message um, repeatedly fails. And, you know, there are a lot of things that can be done there. Nationalism itself has to be improved. So um, there are there are also, there are sort of um, inbuilt toxicities with, with nationalism. Uh, once you get into a, a kind of political uh, framework where you're, um, which is based upon excluding people, uh, there's all sorts of moral problems that come up with that. And so this is something that uh, the, the, you know the, the nationalist right has to um, be more aware of, and they have to address in ways that uh, reduce opposition to their message. You know, because if you're if you're talking about, I mean, look at the way that. Um, the alt right talks about this. They they talk about you know like gassing people or kicking them out of the country, and this raises all sorts of questions. Like you know that's fine uh, if you want to do that, but how are you going to do it, and uh, who's going to support you? How are you going to appeal to the mass of the people with that kind of message? You know, what I mean, most people are not going to go along that route. So you've got to make uh, real nationalism um, morally consistent with what most people uh, are happy to sign off on. Yeah, no, that, that makes very, very good sense to me. It's certainly some of, one of the things that my friends and I have been talking about quite a lot recently um, is, is that uh, stopping mass immigration is one thing um, or even drastically, drastically reducing it. Um, that's one thing. But talking about um, getting rid of people out of the country, that's an entirely different thing. I mean, I myself, I not all my friends agree with me on this. Myself, I'm quite happy to give people large financial incentives to leave. Um, but most people won't take those up, obviously. Um, I'm also very happy to kick out all the illegal immigrants. Um, and I think uh, immigrants who come over and commit serious crimes within, uh, I don't know, say five years of arrival, um, I think those guys should be be able to be kicked out too but i mean that's just my own opinion not all my friends even agree on that um so yeah i i i, I see what you're saying I, I just think it's a it's a difficult balance to get 
Um, I know you guys are on the Affirmative Right website, which incidentally I would recommend to all the viewers. Um, I know you guys have got some quite interesting articles about some of that stuff on, on, on the website there. Um, but c going on from that one, um, I, I just think, you know, we're fighting against state schools, which is like 10, 15 years of basically political indoctrination for kids more than education these days, I think, um, and the university system, obviously, and also like virtually all of, of the mainstream media. And it, it's a very uphill battle. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, nobody said it was going to be easy, did they? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, true, true. I mean, we, we are dealing with a uh, dying country, that, um, in the case of Britain, and uh, a kind of uh, dying civilization in the case of the West. And uh, there are very, very serious problems, which is again why there needs to be a potent dissident right, because the mainstream ideology is is has created this system, which is just so disastrous and um, which is not going to go anywhere and it can only they can only exist by constantly bringing in fresh waves of people from um the most uh, kind of impoverished and dysfunctional parts of the world this is this is the the model they're working on um mm -hmm. i mean you could bring in all these brown people from um various corners of the world and then you can you know through a intense process of assimilation make them into kind of uh, you know british and inverted commerce and uh, then what happens then they they basically um behave in, uh, according to the theory at least they behave in the same way as british people therefore they have a, fer a fertility rate of 1.5 which means that even those um brown assimilated british people would then have to be replaced by fresh waves of uh, mass immigration from wherever you know what i mean so it's just uh, it's, it's never just, ending it's, it's a never, never ending. ending exactly i mean you know it's just like we'd be better off with a, a total economic collapse you know really that would be if we had a total economic collapse at least uh, nobody would want to come here or there or you know to the west i mean yeah no no i don't disagree i mean i i, I actually used to be against uh, pr proportional representation because it always leads to um, coalitions but Actually, our system in the UK at the moment is just so broken. I mean, the, the Conservative Party, the modern Conservative Party, is basically Labour light at best. So I, 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 we've got to do something to change it. I mean, anything we change, however we change it, it could hardly be worse, in my opinion, at the moment. Yeah, it's almost like it's not political even. It's just, you know, because if it was political, there would be differences. But there's no, there's no, essentially, there's a kind of seamlessness to uh, the British political system. It's like uh, there's very there's something very symbiotic about these two parties. You know, uh, you know Labour are there to um, kind of expand the state. And then the Tories kind of come in to sort of kind of clean up the mess so that the next Labour government can then, you know, expand the state some more. And yep. the Conservative governments don't roll back. They don't fight the culture wars. They don't do anything against the kind of um, kind of creeping wokeness that we see everywhere. It, it's like uh, we are dealing with a one-party state. That's that's how I feel about the British political system. Yeah, no, I, I, I really agree with you, actually. I mean, certainly since... Um... Dear Boris has proved to be a complete globalist shill and um, pretty dishonest, in my opinion. Um, I, I wonder, though, um, if uh, it, it, I, I wonder if the you know it's so obvious that if you're going to have this kind of mass fail immigration, it's going to force down wages, and at the same time, it's going to force up um, house prices and also housing costs generally, even if you're renting. And that to me is just so obvious, and most people can't, don't even seem to see that. Yeah, if you um, if you have property, you you'd be very pleased about that. Uh, if you have uh, shares, you you want the economy to keep growing, even if it's um, based upon uh, bringing in uh, you know hordes of people who don't really uh, you know belong to that culture and all that society. 
and this is this is what we're seeing. The uh, the, the kind of more affluent uh, members members of society have every reason to support this, and you know we see how how strongly uh, the corporate world is is behind the woke agenda. Uh, they're all about this, you know. They're, they're the free flow of capital, the free flow of people, and um, that that basically benefits them because they own all the property in the companies, and uh, the ordinary people. If you could get through to them, they they would, uh, you know, they would see their their interests as being directly imperiled by that. And if they if if you just gave them a little bit of uh, true democracy, like we did uh, in twenty sixteen, they would um, they would. I think they would move in the right direction. I mean, because the, the ordinary people, uh, they're not stupid, and they are, they, there has to be quite a massive apparatus of uh, constant propaganda and mind control through the media, through the TV channels, uh, through and, and now through social media to, to kind of stop them, um, you know, doing what's called uh, in, in Orwell's phrase, wrong think. Mm. I agree with that totally. One of the things I, uh, Brutus was talking about the other uh, last week, I think it was, uh, which I also agree with, is uh, Britain would greatly benefit from some sort of law on freedom of association. Um, uh, I don't think we're going to get one very easily, but uh, I think it would hugely benefit if if people were able to form organisations and decide who who could and could not join um, without this constant. Um, you know, there can't be any male-only spaces, for example. There can't be any only white British spaces, that, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit like uh, crossing a, ri a river. There's, there's certain stepping stones to, to get across the river. And, you know, one of the things would be, like, free association. You know, why shouldn't we be able to associate freely um, according to how we wish? And that's one of the freedoms that they, uh, they, they took away from us very, very early, you know, there's, so there's certain things like that. I mean, the the, the principle that Britain uh, has an indigenous population. I mean, that's a, that's something we have to get accepted. There is an indigenous British population. Uh, I mean, this this is a principle that the the left is happy to support anywhere else. I mean, I, I think the other day there was, uh, you know, I think uh, this. Let's see, Donald Trump uh, recognized uh, Morocco's uh, seizure of uh, the Western Sahara in return for uh, Morocco kind of normalizing relations with uh, Israel, of course. And then Jeremy Corbyn tweeted about this, and he said it was a, an outrage, and uh, you know he, he fully supports the Polisario Front because he's all behind the indigenous people of the Western Sahara. So the left is completely behind this principle, uh, unless it refers to uh, you know, British people or European people or you know, white people. And so, you know, this is a, you know, things like this, the, the idea that there is an indigenous population and then the idea that that indigenous population should remain the majority and things like uh, freedom of association, those are like um, preconditions for pushing things in the right direction. Also, a truly, you know, democratic system would probably be one of those things, you know, because we're not going to have a coup d'etat or anything like that, you know. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, you look at New Zealand and the Maoris are indigenous to New Zealand and they've been there, what, five, six hundred years, something like that? Um, certainly a lot less than the British people have been in Britain, <clears throat> not even a quarter of that time, you know. Um, and yet the, there's no such thing as an indigenous British person, supposedly, according to the left and, and to the uh, social liberals. Yeah, yeah, that is quite a comparison, isn't it? Yeah, so... As long as you're a, a Maori and you've only been, yeah, I mean, they're, they're just um, they're just Polynesians, the same same as the people on uh, Hawaii, and who've probably been there for a, a similar length of time. Yeah, I'd say well, someone saying it was seven hundred years. I know it was only a few hundred years, whereas like uh, if you look at uh, DNA studies of the British people, the basically the British DNA hasn't changed in like eons very much the, like the romans didn't really affect it the normans didn't really affect it um it really just hasn't changed very much yeah i mean the maori should be concerned because uh you know while they're given a special status uh in new zealand that special status basically comes comes from the uh the, the white population of uh, new zealand who have this um kind of awkward thing called white guilt and uh, because of this awkward thing called white guilt, the, the New Zealand government's not going to put up too many barriers to the uh, 
sinification of their New Zealand uh, they'll probably allow in as many Chinese people as want who has want to come in there and invest money and once uh, once the number of Chinese people becomes um, you know reaches a critical mass you can say goodbye to that special indigenous status for uh, Maoris I think oh yeah also the same in Australia absolutely Australia also has um, very heavy um, Chinese immigration you're in, uh, I think you're in, you said you're in Victoria. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in Melbourne. And the Melbourne. Part of Melbourne yeah, yeah, the, the, the SJW capital of Australia that also had the longest lockdown of anywhere in the Western world, which will be the next thing I'm going to ask you about, actually. But Yeah, um, our, our friend, uh, you know, all right, uh, sorry, affirmative rights friend, uh, Richard Wollstonecroft, he's, he's from the same city, so. Yes, yes, I know, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, we like the area I live in in Melbourne. The, the actual like, I'm near, quite near the centre of Melbourne at the moment, although I'm moving in the new year. Um, and it's uh, already, I'd say, probably sixty percent Chinese. Wow, that much, eh? Yeah, in the particular part of Melbourne I live in, yeah, it's it's about sixty percent Chinese. So much and so that if you they're, go, they're, to... they're lovely people, the Chinese, but uh, you know, you don't want to you don't want them to take over your country. Yeah, I mean, I, like they don't cause loads of crime and all that kind of stuff, but they're not Australians, you know. <laughs> and uh, they don't regard themselves as Australians either, as far as I can work out. Um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, like, it's, it's so bad where I live that if you go to the local supermarket, if the Chinese guys don't buy it, then the supermarket doesn't stock it. So, you know, uh, so it's, um, it's one reason I'm moving. It's not the main reason, but it is one reason I'm moving. Um, so, so you're moving to uh, somewhere more rural, I see? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm moving out, out of Melbourne, yes. Um, like, I, I've lived um, all, all the way up and down the east coast of Australia over the last 20 years, pretty much. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, 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 Melbourne is a nice city in the sense that it's got lovely 19th, 19th century buildings, it's got uh, beautiful parks and, and gardens, again from the nineteenth century. But the, the, and the, also uh, charming Somalian gangs, I believe. Yep, yep, we do have those too. We do have those, um, and of course, da Dan Andrews, dictator Dan, as we know him, um, is the socialist premier of Victoria, and he is the one Australian state premier who um, supported the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative which uh, much to the annoyance of the federal government, but I don't know that there's much they can do about it at the moment. But, uh, and also, like I said, we had the longest and heaviest lockdown of anywhere in the Western world, as far as I'm aware. We basically weren't allowed to go more than five kilometers from our homes for like four, four or five months. It was ridiculous. Yeah, I think everywhere that uh, that's that's got a left winger in power is... Yeah, I've done something um, similar, depending upon the the, the degree of the uh, the uh, so-called COVID infection. You know. Yeah, that that actually brings me on to the, the next point I was going to ask you about. What do you think about this? Uh, like, we see um, Boris Johnson in Britain, we see Joe Biden in America, um, we see Macron in France, and Merkel, and of course Justin Trudeau in Canada. We see all of these guys with the Build Back Better slogan. What, what do you think about this uh, Great Reset and uh, the, the um, China virus being used as an excuse uh, for this Great Reset? Well, the, uh, the, the Great Reset, this, this term is, um, it's like the new Agenda 21, isn't it? I mean, you, every now and then you get a phrase or a, uh, an idea that goes viral and it sort of basically denotes the same thing, a kind of sinister plot by uh, evil globalists working in perfect harmony with each other to uh, control and distort the world. Uh, I, I kind of see it as the latest uh, iteration of that. And I don't really buy it, to be honest. I, th I think there is a there's a kind of um, the I think uh, social media and the Internet has created a kind of uh, market for a uh, kind of nebulous conspiracy theory. And I'm not, I'm not against it. I think it's good for people to to have a sense of paranoia sometimes. Uh, it's good if people believe that uh, there are evil glo globalists working in cahoots, but I don't necessarily think that's the case. My view of the uh, the global elite is that they're not uh, really in charge. They're 
they're not really con uh, controlling everything as much as uh, you know some of the more paranoid might think they are. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a bit overstated this um, this great reset. I can't possibly explain why they're all using the the, the, the same alliterative uh, phrase though. A bit build back better. Doesn't yeah, it's, it's quite sinister in my opinion. But yeah, I mean, you, people you say it's, right. people say it's B B B, and B kind of looks like the the number six. So it's mm -hmm. like six six six, and so therefore it represents the. Uh, that thing in the book of revelations that represents the antichrist and uh yeah I, I guess kamala harris is the antichrist that must be what it all boils down to so you could see be, there could be some truth in that <laughs> <laughs> there could be some truth i mean I, I don't mind i don't really don't mind if people believe that because it um i think uh, most people or maybe all people you, you your only choice is to be a kind of passive dupe or to be some kind of crank. And I think being a crank is is a, a little bit more healthy. Yeah. yeah I, do. I understand you're in Japan. Now, Japan seems to have coped very, very well with this China virus without excessive lockdowns and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's because they're so racist, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, Japan is... Um, yeah, I mean, all right, you know, people go on about in the in the in the distant right, people go on about Japan as this kind of perfect ethno state, blah blah blah. Uh, essentially, Japan is a lot less um, interconnected with the rest of the world than your average uh, kind of uh, white Western state. I mean, some of Australia or Britain or America, uh, they have a lot more um, people coming and going and from all sorts of places. So, Japan is much more of a discrete entity. Um, and, and the Jap one of the things the Japanese did was um, they they made it very hard for people to to travel to and fro uh, internationally. But uh, in, within Japan, people were encouraged to travel around. You know, so it's a bit opposite to um, a lot of other places because I think um, most countries they did the opposite. They they stopped people traveling from uh, you know A to B inside the country, but they didn't do too much to restrict. Uh, global international travel yep. so i think that was one of the reasons uh, the other reason of course is japanese people are used to wearing face masks that's not a problem for them and uh, they, they they don't shake hands so much they prefer to do this weird thing called bowing and uh, they are generally speaking a lot more hygienic than uh, most uh, people especially uh, you know compared with their uh, people in britain i have to say <laughs> yeah. so uh, I'd say there are a number of factors, and also the the, the weather was a factor because I think um, the um, like most flus they they, they like uh, cold moist weather. No, no, the cold dry weather I think uh, is what they prefer the most, isn't it? They prefer the winter for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe the Japanese Japanese uh, winter is quite uh, sunny. It's quite dry, but it's quite sunny. Um, so there might be a number of other factors as well. So. Um, but I think that's enough to be getting on with, really. I mean, uh, the thing I did, I have noticed, is, uh, like I've been following some of the stuff that people like uh, Dave Cullen from Computing Forever have been doing about lockdowns and stuff, um, and something over $200 billion has been transferred from small businesses to huge multinational corporations because of the lockdowns, because... Um, uh, obviously, the huge multinational corporations are doing very well, and uh, a great many of the small businesses have been shut down. And in fact, quite a lot of them have gone bankrupt as a result. I know in, in uh, Melbourne and Victoria, for example, something like 20% of small businesses um, have been destroyed by, by the lockdowns. So that, that, that's one thing I certainly have noticed, and um, I wonder if that's entirely accidental. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm fine for people to, to, to think it's uh, done on purpose, you know, because uh, then they'll, people will get angry and they'll want to do something about it. But, uh, you know, that, that, that is quite predictable of what would happen um, in, a, in a case like this. If there was a pandemic, the government would actually, you know, force lots of small businesses uh, not to operate, uh, where, where, uh, whereby these, um, these big multinational companies like, especially, uh, I guess everybody's thinking of Amazon here, would uh, would be the, the main beneficiary, and uh, so big multinationals 
will are better equipped to deal with um, all sorts of turbulence. And uh, you know, this is what we're seeing here. Whenever things become turbulent for the for for um, everybody in society, uh, those big companies can can stand well above it, and so they they're in the, the best position to to reap the rewards. And so we're seeing something similar here. Um. Is it on purpose? I mean, that's a big question. I mean, uh, I think we have overreacted, uh, generally speaking, around the world to the uh, coronavirus. And uh, there's a lot of arguments on that. There's a lot of people who will uh, say one thing and people say the other. But my my uh, view is that we, um, you know, it's around the world, most Western countries have uh, overreacted. I say Sweden and Japan have probably, you know, got the balance right. You know, because you it's especially in the early days, you know, people didn't really know what was going on. So it was understandable that uh, they maybe overreacted at that time. We've gone on, we've gone on overreacting for month after month after month. And um, all these measures that uh, uh, people, that governments have taken to in like, uh, you know, in Melbourne and other places in my native Scotland, they haven't really had an enormous uh, impact in uh, shutting down the virus. Uh, but what they have done is, uh, like you say, they've destroyed a lot of, um, you know, economic prospects for a lot of people. They've um, the economy, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but on the other hand, it's it's given the ex it's given governments the excuse they need, and they always do need an excuse to vastly um, inflate the money supply. And you know, this is something. This is like uh, the latest batch of QE really is coming out of all of this, you know. And so, if you can get people emotionally upset enough, then you kind of you're. What we're seeing is a, a kind of war economy, because mm. because um, like during World War Two, everybody's uh, upset about you know this man in Germany and that you know those people over in Japan, and uh, they're. Uh, they're sort of all their emotions were whipped up, and then on the back of that, you're able to greatly expand um, government spend in in every you know, all these um, ar armaments um, programs, and that had an enormous you know stimulus effect on the economy. The American economy did extremely well out of World War II, mm -hmm. and so when you have a kind of uh, fear, a panic, uh, everybody's upset about something, it generates a lot of uh, emotional energy. And it's that emotional energy that can keep all this fake money afloat. So I think there is a kind of complex uh, economic equation at work here. I'm not sure how much of that is um, conscious or and how much of that is unwitting. You know, I, I think that's something that needs to be um, considered anyway. Okay. Well, that, that, that segues quite nicely into the next thing I was going to ask about. Um, as an expat myself, there's a couple of people who've been mentioning this in the chat too. Um, as an expat myself, like I, I left the UK after I left the British Army and I moved to South Africa. I lived in South Africa for um, over 15 years. Then I met an Aus Australian girl and I moved to Australia 20 years ago now. Um, I'm an old bugger, by the way. But um, anyway, uh, I, I, so I'm, I'm an expat. I, I like my son is still in the UK. He's actually serving in the Royal Navy. Um, but uh, I'm an expat and I go back to the UK um, like from time to time. And when I went back for my son's passing out parade from Dartmouth, from the Royal Naval College, um, I actually took some time to go and have a look around London. I, I originally came from inner South London, from a place called Bermondsey, which was uh, kind of cockney, but on the south bank of the river. And... Um, I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked at, at the changes. Um, and I think one of the things that being an expat allows one to do is that when you do go back, because you're not there all the time and the changes are not gradual as they are for people who live there, uh, you really notice the, like the huge changes. If, you, if you've not been back for like, um, on one occasion, I, I didn't go back for like six years. And um, I was really shocked. Uh, the enormous changes in the UK. And, and I think perhaps being an expat sometimes allows one to see your home nation uh, more clearly than, than people who are actually living there. I don't know what you think about that, Cole. Uh, well, I'm not from uh, 
anywhere near London. So I guess uh, the the um, the changes. Um, well, I'm from Ayrshire, so the changes are not quite as drastic in Ayrshire when I go back uh, to to my uh, hometown. Uh, but when I when I, I remember once when I came back, uh, there were all these bloody Gaelic signs everywhere, you know. So uh, it was a bit of a shock to the system because most of these uh, <laughs> most of these Gaelic words are completely unpronounceable. Yeah, I, I lived in Stirling for a while uh, back in the 1980s. A uh, beautiful part of the world, um, re really nice. And one of my favourite parts of the UK actually is uh, around Cape Wrath, right up in the northwest part of Scotland. Uh, I, I used to go and go for holidays up there occasionally. Um, and I agree with you. I mean, like the Highlands is um, probably a bit different, but certainly I think if you if you go to Edinburgh and Glasgow, you would have noticed changes for sure. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. I think um, what I've noticed, though, um, on recent trips back to the UK, or not so recent now, but uh, on pr uh, previous trips back to the UK, is that there seem to be a lot of uh, refugees being dotted about. Yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> there were um, some Syrian, or so-called Syrian, because Syrian refugees basically mean anybody from the Middle East who, or who's pretending to be a Syrian. And uh, there's some Syrian refugees dropped into Ayrshire, uh, there were some Syrians dropped into the Isle of Bute, into Rothsey. These, um, they, they, they like to, they seem to like to drop um, the refugee population into these dilapidated seaside towns that, uh, you know, have all this unused um, kind of accommodation because people don't go for their holidays there anymore, you know. Uh, so that seems to be a bit of a, a thing. Uh, yeah, I've, I've noticed that the, 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 there's been a lot of stuff on YouTube, certainly from uh, some British nationalist guys, about uh, refugees being dumped into little rural Welsh villages and places like that. Yeah, and um, I think uh, yeah, for, I've, 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 have, I've been to Germany not so long ago, and also some, uh, some friends went to Germany, and they said that the Germans, um, they kind of, uh, they have a lot of refugees, but they kind of manage it a lot, a lot better. It's more efficient. You know, it's typical. You know, difference between Germany and Britain. They, <laughs> they have they have actual refugee centres, which are usually tucked away, and there's somebody there to keep an eye on people, and you know, stuff like that. Whereas in Britain, it just it seems that they just like let them go. They they fix them up with some uh, hotel accommodation, put pocket in their money, and then just let them wander around and do what they like. And I get the impression the Germans keep much more of an eye on their, uh, you know, migrant refugee population. Yeah, could well be. Could well be. It, it, that's certainly possible, I think. Um, which, which is a bad thing because it means that they have a greater capacity to bring them in, you see. So the more dysfunctional the uh, refugee uh, settlement is, the lower the capacity to take in refugees will be. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It certainly does. Um, I, I, like carrying on from that one, what what do you think about the future of the union of the United Kingdom? Um, do do you think Scotland will go will get independence, um, or or do you think uh, the the last referendum was a more realistic view of what most Scots actually think? Oh well, uh, well you know, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, she's actually from a a little place. A, uh, a couple of miles from my uh, hometown, really. So, uh, you know, I could say she's a, a local girl when it, you know, as far as, far as I'm concerned, but uh, I can't stand her, really. I just I completely loathe Nicola Sturge, and I can't believe that anybody would vote for her or any party that she's associated with. But um, back in, I think it was 2014, we had the referendum on uh, Scottish independence. I, I couldn't vote in that because. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not as Scottish as uh, some uh, migrant who had been in the country for six months. Uh, <laughs> um, at the time, I was I, I thought that Scottish uh, independence was would I actually supported it at the time, and the reason I supported it was because uh, I thought it would um, have a beneficial effect on English politics because you get rid of uh, about fifty left wing MPs from the Westminster Parliament that way. Because in those uh, at that time, Scotland was voted overwhelmingly uh, Labour slash SNP. So I thought that would have a good effect on England. I also thought it would probably have a good effect on Scotland because an independent Scotland would soon have to really, um, 
you know, wake up and, uh, you know, pull up its bootstraps uh, if it was independent. And there wouldn't be much um, scope there for uh, cosy socialism. So I thought it would uh, push Scotland in a more right wing direction. And it would also alleviate England from this uh, left wing burden of a kind of plus 50 uh, socialist MPs coming from north of the border. Uh, so at the time, I was right behind it. But, uh, you know, now I think uh, the, the kind of independence boat has sailed, you know, because um, uh, we're, with Brexit, we're starting to see increasing divergence between uh, the UK and the EU. And the more divergence there is, the harder it, would, it will be for uh, Scotland to, um, to become independent, I think. It's, you know, because uh, the more that um, Britain and, and the EU diverge, um, the more will be the leap that Scotland has, the greater will be the leap that Scotland has to make in order to become independent. So it's going to be interesting to see how that uh, impacts on the, uh, the fortunes of the SNP. Yeah, I, I, like, I, I'm a unionist. I mean, I, like, I'm, 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 like, my father was English with, with some Scots bits and my mother was Irish with some Welsh bits. And uh, I'm totally, I'm totally a unionist. I, I think um, uh, if Scotland got independence, it would be worse for England and Wales, uh, and also worse for Scotland. I like, I, I don't see any advantage to it at all. Um, Britain is uh, as small as it needs to be. It doesn't really want to be any smaller, in my my, my uh, humble opinion. Um, yeah, yeah, I think. Um... If you break up the United Kingdom, you start getting to yeah, you start getting to the level where you have countries that are um, kind of so small that they're no longer able to function as fully independent countries, as it were. You know what I mean? Because uh, yeah. and, and England without Scotland, it's 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 a bit bigger than Holland. You know, <laughs> it's it's not much uh, it's not much bigger. And, and, then, uh, and then there's st strategic stuff like shipbuilding. Uh, naval bases, all this kind of stuff. I, I just don't know how you would possibly sort that out. It, like, it, it seems very, very difficult to me. Yeah, it'd be very difficult to uh, relocate our our American-controlled nuclear deterrent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. well, there's that. But, I mean, I actually, like I said, my son's serving in the Royal Navy, and um, uh, there, certainly a lot of the naval shipbuilding in the UK, for example, is in Scotland. Um, in fact, most of it, not all, not all, but most of it. Um, uh, so I look at it from that point of view. But I, I just think that Scots and English people would both be worse off. Um, if you look at the history of Britain since the Union, which was like in the uh, early 18th century, um, the Scots and, uh, and the English um, cooperated really well. Um, and, and there's been many great Scotsmen in British history. I mean, you know. Oh, uh, that's, all, that's all true. But I think you're mainly making a kind of historical nostalgia argument for, uh, which is fine, you know, because I, I think that there is a lot of historical nostalgia about Britain. And I think that's a good thing. It's part of, uh, you know, what makes Britain work uh, as an economy. But the economic argument, I think Britain is a, uh, is a kind of status economy. And people invest in Britain or they, uh, you know, they're, they're happy to support our currency in various ways because we are Britain and because Britain has a certain brand and, and, and an uh, image which is connected to things like, you know, the United Kingdom, uh, Scotland and England together, Wales, of course, Northern Ireland and uh, the British Commonwealth, the Queen. All those things create a kind of status in the world. Uh, one of the five permanent members of the Security Council, and so on. And without without that, um, the British economy would have to get by a lot more on its uh, on its real merits, and that would be a bit dicey, I, I should imagine, especially at first. Yeah, no, I, d I don't disagree with that at all. I mean, also, incidentally, I'm a historian like the Sarah started off. Uh, I started writing uh, military history when I was uh, in my teens, in the sense of people paying me for it, so uh, I, I do I do tend to do that, and I people have often said that I'm uh, uh, a bit nostalgic for the old days. And yeah, I like I'll fully admit I'm a, I was a supporter of the British Empire. I'm probably the last of the Empire loyalists, in fact, um, and I also support Kanzuk. Um, I, I think that uh, if, if uh, Britain 
Canada, Australia, and New Zealand can get closer ties, it would be good for all of them, to be honest with you. Oh, yeah, yeah. I definitely uh, believe in Kanzak myself, yeah. I mean, I mean, the British Empire was, was I think it was good for um, everybody involved, and I think it was particularly good for the uh, the um, the Scots and the Irish. Not that the Irish are very grateful either, you know, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, without the, the British Empire, you know, the... the, the um, I mean, most, most, most is that a Scots Terrier I hear there? No, it's, it's a cross track Russell rescue dog who's 12 and he's a pest. Oh, wow, well, it sounds like anyway. But with uh, without the British Empire, uh, so many Scottish people would have, um, in historically speaking, would have had such limited um prospects, really. They uh, which would have been a complete, you know, tragic waste of talent because you know, Scottish people, at least historically, have been extremely talented. Yeah, I mean, they played a huge part in, in like the pioneering days of Canada and Australia, and New Zealand, and all this kind of thing, as did the Irish and the Welsh, as well as the English. Um, uh, absolutely, I, I, I totally agree with that. And as I say, I've got bits of all of the British races in my bloodline. Um, yeah, I'm just my, uh, mainly, mainly Scottish with a tiny bit of Danish, you know. So, yeah. well, Danes are cool. I like Denmark. Actually, <laughs> I, I went to Denmark with the British Army. It was the one place I went with the British Army where the, the locals actually liked us because they mm. remembered the British liberating them at the end of World War Two. But uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I actually like the Danes. I'm quite fond of those guys. Um, the the other, next thing I was going to ask you, I, I don't know how much time you've got, Colin, because I'm, like, I'm happy to go for two hours if you are, if you don't get bored. Uh, no, I'd, I'd just like to stick to to the, uh, the one hour because, you know, I've got something uh, kind of All right. Up. Well, in that case, we'll move on. But that, you can, we, can off, we can obviously do this on, a, on another occasion anyway. Yeah, so. I'd love to, man. I'd, I'd really love to. Don't um, want to spoil yeah. the audience too much, you know. <laughs> I don't know. They put up with my stuff, so they'll be quite happy to listen to you. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, I, 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 the next thing I was going to ask, well, where, where do you think British nationalism stands now and where do you think it can go? Like currently, like when you look around at British nationalism today, political parties and would-be political parties, um, like how bad is that? Because I, I don't see it as being very good. I, like I see probably uh, seven or eight different tiny little parties. Um, and where do you think it might go to be more useful to the British people? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's a kind of interesting... Um point uh, we've, we've, we've reached an in interesting point because you know british politics has been completely overshadowed and dominated by the brexit question and you know hopefully with uh, you know the um no deal that looks likely that will be um kind of pushed out of the way a bit and so then you know it's like post brexit britain that will be the post brexit britain period and so then people will be looking around for other issues. And uh, I think, uh, you know, immigration, assimilation, those kinds of issues will come into uh, the political bloodstream a lot more. Um, and that, that basically gives uh, a nationalist uh, party a, a lot of scope to, um, you know, make political capital, to uh, make uh, progress. So I think, uh, you know, but... Uh, um, the future could be um, quite promising if you if you think of it in that terms. Like we've done Brexit, what's next? Looking at the uh, the political parties that uh, you know are there to take advantage of that uh, political niche, uh, there's not really anything great, is there? I mean, I think the best thing at the moment would be for Britain. Uh, everybody criticizes them for all sorts of reasons. Uh, I know that Brutus uh, can't stand uh, Marie Waters and uh, so on. But, uh, you know, that's uh, and of course, their their um, their agenda is very circumscribed by the uh, kind of um, ideological or metapolitical ecosystem as it's defined by uh, the media and uh, um, the culture and what is acceptable to, you know, voters. Most British people, they really do want a restriction in um, immigration. Yeah, this is a uh, this is a non-controversial issue, I think, 
it's it's not it's um the the accusation of racism because you want to restrict immigration i think that's a lot weaker than it's ever been uh, also british people um another non controversial issue that most british people would would probably all be all behind is assimilation and uh, again this is something you could say we need more assimilation and of course now personally i don't i'm not a great fan of assimilation i don't really uh, see it as a good thing particularly to assimilate if you could if you're very good at assimilating it means you're you're essentially very good at replacing yourself but uh, the benefit of um, having a lot of focus on assimilation is it's a deterrent to certain population groups to come into your country because if you think about uh, you know radical islamic muslims they're not that keen on right, yeah on assimilating and so on so i think uh, those kind of issues offer a lot of scope uh, for you know well-organized nationalist or uh, you know pro-nationalist or pro nationalist lean-in parties to exploit um so but uh, you know uh, who are the who, who are the um, the leaders there's, there's not i'm not really seeing much talent there i mean you could say that nigel farage might be included yeah. in that uh, definition uh, you know he's he's had a long career. He's I don't know how how many more years he's got in in him. So we we've got to start seeing a bit of talent, uh, like real talent that's that's going to come through and understand the pitfalls and the opportunities. And so that's that's really what we've got to keep an eye out for. I just uh, don't. Um, I, I, what what perplexes me about British nationalism in in inverted commas at the moment is that uh, some of it is is it's not really british nationalism it's it's either a kind of white american nationalism or it's almost like 1930s german nationalism i i, I just don't understand how people think that stuff's going to fly in the uk in yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting because i didn't even think of patriotic alternative until now because to me patriotic alternative is just a joke uh, party of larpers and uh, neo-nazis and so they've got they've, i mean just forget about them they're not going to go anywhere they're just there to waste time and uh, piss people around yeah i think they're a dead end and i think then they might even be a deliberate dead end if you understand what i mean oh, uh, oh for sure yeah so yeah I, okay colin uh, you you want to keep this on now so um it's been great talking to you i would love to have you on again um yep. Uh, and and uh, really good. And uh, if, is there anything you want to show before you leave? Um, I just like to to um, you know get people to have a look at the affirmative right site and also the trad news site. So please go there. As uh, plenty of good content. And uh, so put, put a couple of links in, and uh, you know I will talk again, Iron Duke. Yeah, I'd love to, man. Um, okay, guys. Uh, Good conversation um and do as colin said please go and check out the affirmative right website um it, it is really worth going to have a look at